Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tim Belsky, and I am uh, a branch chief under the Pharmaceutical Countermeasures Infrastructure Division uh, for the uh, Biopharmaceutical Manufacturing Partnership Branch. Uh, unfortunately, our division director, Mike Angelostro, uh, couldn't make it today, and so I will be giving the PCI uh, overview, and then I'll just roll right into a, an overview of what we're doing uh, in the Biomap branch. Um, and, and before we get started, I want to introduce uh, uh, my fellow uh, uh, branch uh, chiefs, uh, Ms. Arlene Joyner and Mr. Joe Figlio, and uh, you will hear from both of them here very shortly. And so when you look at BARDA, uh, the organizational structure, um, our division, PCI, fits under the uh, medical countermeasure uh, program. Uh, which includes uh, the other uh, advanced research and development shops of the uh, CBRN shop, the um, uh, influenza emerging infectious diseases, as well as the diagnostics and, and drive. Uh, and, and this is very important from a structural standpoint, in my opinion, uh, from, a, from a BARDA standpoint, as manufacturing is part and parcel to uh, product development, not only from the uh, process development from the early stages through advanced development, but also making sure that whatever medical countermeasure is being developed is scalable to meet our nation's needs relative to responding to a public health emergency. And in that light, that's where PCI's uh, role comes in, is ensuring that the manufacturing infrastructure for vaccines, for therapeutics, for small molecules, uh, in this, in, in the country, uh, is capable of responding to public health emergencies. And PCI's role was really highlighted uh, during the COVID-19 response when we, uh, through Operation Warp Speed, uh, six vaccines were uh, prioritized uh, for uh, additional development. And for a number of them, uh, there was a lack of manufacturing capacity within the United States for those products to be further uh, process developed and then also manufactured. So based on those lessons learned uh, from the, the COVID response, as well as you know the uh, significant uh, time we've spent uh, in this space, uh, we, are, we take the end-to-end -end approach to manufacturing. So not only looking at the drug substance and drug product manufacturing, but then also looking at the supply chains uh, that go into manufacturing uh, all of these products. Uh, one of the, the major lessons learned uh, from the COVID response was that the, the constraints in the supply chain uh, were significant and that any time that we're looking at preparing for the next public health emergency, we have to take uh, supply chain into consideration. And you'll hear a whole lot more about that uh, from all three of us when we get into our uh, uh, branch overviews. And, and as I mentioned, uh, Arlene, Joe, and I are, th are the branch chiefs under uh, Mike Angelostro. Um, and within each of our division, each of our branches, uh, you'll hear a, a lot more detail of, about what each of us does. Um, but as you can see, our smiling faces there. Uh, uh, Again, you'll, you'll hear a whole lot more here in the next few minutes. And when you look at where PCI fits within the BARDA strategy, it's really taking that end-to-end -end approach to manufacturing medical countermeasures to respond to any pandemic or public health emergency. So from the standpoint of the size and scale of the manufacturing capabilities and capacities uh, that we are working on, we are really looking at that, that commercial scale or population scale manufacturing uh, to make sure that it's ready, uh, that it's, it's within the United States so that we have more control. Um, and as I mentioned, looking at that, uh, at the supply chains uh, that would feed into those uh, medical countermeasure manufacturing campaigns. And this is our team uh, within PCI. Um, I've been at uh, BARDA for three years, and before that I came from the Department of Defense and, and worked there uh, all of my career until uh, December of 2019, right before uh, the uh, COVID pandemic. 
And what struck me the most about working with BARDA, just from my own personal uh, perspective, is the breadth and depth of the experience of uh, the PCI team uh, at BARDA. Uh, I don't know of another organization within the federal government that has as much uh, industry experience in manufacturing process development across the board. And so this is a fantastic team of a, a mix of federal employees as well as uh, subject matter experts that are brought in through different uh, uh, contracts. And we also have a lot of acquisition and contracting support uh, program analysts. And um, this is the best team I've ever worked with. So I am very proud to be part of the PCI team. And as I mentioned, uh, we do have the three branches. We're going to get into a lot of that uh, detail in a little bit. But as far as uh, the Biomap branch, we are looking at that, uh, primarily looking at the pandemic scale, drug substance manufacturing. Um, but you'll hear a little bit more about this in a couple minutes. We're also looking at workforce development within the United States. That was another lesson learned. And also strengthening the raw materials supply chains, uh, primarily for mRNA, or at least that's what we've been focusing on uh, right now. And our Lean's team, again, you'll hear a lot, whole lot more about uh, her branch. Uh, she's primarily focused on fill finish manufacturing, but also has a uh, very capable team looking at the, the capacities and capabilities for uh, drug uh, substance uh, manufacturing of small molecules and, and active pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, and she's also working a lot with the industrial base expansion of fill finish capacity within the U.S. And Joe Figlio's uh, branch really focusing on manufacturing of uh, flu vaccines, but then also uh, has been the lead for a lot of our uh, capacity expansions for the consumables uh, that go into bioprocessing, as well as the needles, syringes, and vials, also sterilization uh, uh, capacities uh, within the United States. And he has a team of uh, industry subject matter experts in supply chain management, specifically biopharmaceutical manufacturing, that he leads and has uh, uh, constant uh, communication with our industry partners in that space. And you'll hear a whole lot more from Joe uh, in a few minutes about that. So when you look at what PCI has done uh, in, you know, in the past, um, primarily when you look at our COVID-19 response, uh, we were uh, part and parcel to the Operation Warp Speed mission and then later the Countermeasure Acceleration Group, uh, and which has now uh, morphed into what they call h uh within uh, Department of Health and Human Services. And so it was really about identifying and targeting those key investments that we needed to make uh, to expand uh, the number of vials uh, and consumables and the raw materials for our industrial base expansion efforts. Also, looking at the fill finish manufacturing network, uh, we had set that up um, back in 2012, 2013. You'll hear a, little, a lot more about that uh, in a few minutes. Also, working with our industry partners to uh, expand uh, API manufacturing, and there's a, there's a uh, we have a big effort in that area uh, right now that you'll also hear uh, more about. Um, the Legacy Centers for Innovation in Advanced Development Manufacturing, or the CIADM program, uh, that was, those were contracts with three of our industry partners to set up uh, manufacturing uh, to both support uh, pandemic flu uh, vaccine uh, product development and manufacturing, but also to provide cord services. And I will uh, talk a little bit about the, the um, transition from CIADM to Biomap, uh, and I'll get into a lot more detail of that. And then also the supply chain oversight that I mentioned that, uh, that we, the, all three branches are involved with, but primarily that falls within uh, Joe's uh, portfolio. Um, and as far as looking forward, what we're really looking to do is, is really apply the lessons learned primarily from the COVID-19 response, but then also uh, the lessons that we have learned being a, uh, being a division within BARDA from inception. Uh, originally, our, our division was the uh, Manufacturing Facilities and Engineering Team, now it's uh, PCI, um, and really applying all those lessons learned, not only from being a government entity that's involved in manufacturing, but also the lessons from the, the team uh, that has extensive industry experience. 
and, and one of the, the main uh, 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 things that we're going to be working on, and I'll uh, talk about it in more detail, is the formation of the Biopharmaceutical Manufacturing Consortium, or, uh, or Biomac. Um, also uh, looking at uh, potential bilateral agreements, additional agreements for drug substance and pandemic scale manufacturing, and also uh, doing additional investments uh, in, in the industrial base to expand and onshore uh, manufacturing um, as, as we see uh, necessary. But we're not just targeting our, the, the proven uh, technologies. We also recognize that we need to make investments uh, in, in manufacturing innovations. And so we're hoping to be on the cutting edge of identifying what those manufacturing uh, technologies are that can be incorporated uh, into our manufacturing processes uh, to meet the, uh, the, the, the aspirational goal that's been laid out. And if you uh, heard the uh, uh, early plenary session, uh, from Dr. Dispro, you know, the uh, American Pandemic Preparedness Plan sets out to uh, manufacture enough vaccines for the entire U.S. population within 130 days and the, the globe for 200 days. And so we know that there, there are only so many technologies that can get us there now, and so we need to make investments in innovation, in process intensification, process optimization, and anything else that we uh, see that, that needs to be further advanced that can be incorporated into industry so that we can meet that very lofty goal. Um, and then also, one of the things we're going to get into when I uh, get into my branch, uh, workforce development is also a, a key component of what the, the branch is working on uh, relative to the pharmaceutical industry. And I'll get into a little bit more detail here in, in a few minutes. We've also seen Okay, so when you look at the three, uh, the, the three branches, again, we are looking to do uh, the uh, biomap is, is, is primarily focused on pandemic scale uh, drug substance manufacturing, workforce development, and the, the raw materials. And then CDMO branch, Arlene's branch, primarily focused on uh, fill finish and uh, API manufacturing uh, and also expanding fill finish from a uh, uh, domestic supply standpoint, and Joe's team um, looking at the, uh, uh, all, all the things we just talked about. Did I go in the wrong direction? All right. I thought that looked familiar. All right. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. All right, so we're going to talk in a lot more detail tomorrow in two breakout sessions. Um, uh, Mine is at 11 o'clock tomorrow, uh, 11 to 12, to talk about uh, the, uh, the, the Biomap program. Arlene's uh, is at uh, 2 to 3 tomorrow to talk about the CDMO uh, net, uh, network. And Joe, do you have a breakout session? I, I don't see you have one. Okay, so, but I, I think within Biomap and the CDMO network, we'll be talking about some of the things that each of those branches are, are doing. So. With that, I will get into uh, what we're thinking about with Biomap. And, and really, Biomap, the, the best way to think about it is, is really applying the lessons learned from the CIADM program and uh, doing it better, doing uh, domestic population scale manufacturing better. And so when we look at not only the 10 plus years of the CIADM program, applying those lessons learned, but also what we learned when we, when we needed to execute the CIADMs or at least large scale manufacturing for the COVID-19 response, um, there, there were a lot of things we did, did well and a lot of things that we didn't do well. And so when we look at uh, pandemic scale drug substance manufacturing, we need to make sure that we're doing a, a number of things. One, that we're teaming with proven companies uh, that are routinely making uh, commercial scale vaccines primarily, um, but also uh, uh, potentially uh, biologic products and therapeutics. Um, but then also looking at uh, adopting the innovations to make those products better, faster, and cheaper. Um, but not only are we looking at uh, capabilities and capacities from, a, from an infrastructure standpoint, from a facilities and equipment, but we also need to make sure that the quality systems are in place that can support those large-scale uh, manufacturing of licensed products. 
and also that the workforce is, is there. That was, those are two main uh, takeaways from the COVID-19 response where when we needed to rely on uh, manufacturing partners uh, that had not done large scale manufacturing or commercial scale manufacturing, uh, they needed to uh, ramp up not only the uh, personnel or the workforce uh, needed to uh, uh, operate the facility, but then also their uh, facility quality systems were not pressure tested uh, uh, in the sense that they were not routinely doing or manufacturing uh, at, at commercial scale. And so those are a lot of this, the, uh, the core tenets of Biomap as we move forward and looking at the industry partners that we need to partner uh, uh, to, to meet those goals. And, uh, and, and this really needs to be an interagency public-private partnership. So not only are we uh, in constant communication with our industry partners, we know that we can't do this by ourselves, uh, even within the government. And so uh, we have uh, uh, partnerships uh, not only within BARDA, uh, with, the, uh, with the other advanced research and development uh, divisions of CBRN and, and flu division, but then also with our uh, partners within the Department of Defense, uh, the Joint Program Executive Office for Chem Bio Rad Nuke Defense, as well as Joint Science and Technology Office, uh, and and uh, within HHS we are looking at you know teaming with uh, with uh, NIH and NIAID, um, as well as within BARDA in the Drive program we have. Uh, Good uh, conversations with, with Drive and GHIC uh, that you heard from today um, in helping them target the types of technologies and innovations uh, that may be required uh, to move uh, the, the drug substance manufacturing forward. Um, and, and I want to spend the last few minutes on workforce development. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we really see workforce development as part of manufacturing infrastructure. And so, we really need to make sure that, uh, that the workforce of tomorrow is prepared uh, to meet the large-scale demands of manufacturing and, and biopharmaceutical manufacturing. Uh, that was another lesson learned uh, from the COVID-19 response, is that we had a number of facilities that needed to hire hundreds of people just to, to meet that demand. And what we're finding, and, and we'll probably talk about it uh, some more tomorrow in our breakout, is that a large section of the U.S. population doesn't even know biopharmaceutical manufacturing is even a career field. And so we need to change that. And we're working with uh, a number of different partners uh, in the workforce development space. Um, uh, the uh, Department of Commerce with their, with their Nimble uh, program. Um, we're, we're working with um, uh, industry, uh, uh, industry teams, um, the, the, the biotechnology uh, industry organization, um, and also internationally. Um, and one of the, the big successes so far has been to bring over uh, three cohorts of students from South Africa um, to our, uh, our partners at Texas A&M University and their National Center for Therapeutics Manufacturing uh, to do what we call the boot camp uh, bioprocessing manufacturing training, um, and we are now working uh, with Texas A&M to expand their course offerings to include mRNA vaccine manufacturing, and uh, and we're also also uh, working with um, the South Africans to bring over a number of different uh, uh, cohorts uh, from across the African continent. Uh, to uh, take that training as well. And so we're looking at a number of different um, uh, paths um, to both increase awareness of bio, uh, manufacture, biopharmaceutical manufacturing uh, in this country and then maybe also looking at reaching consensus around a certification program uh, so that we can have more non-degreed people enter uh, this industry, which I think will help, uh, will, will help the country, will help uh, employment rates, and, um, and it's called out in the bioeconomy executive order as well. Um, and so it's a, 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 a significant line of effort uh, for the Biomap team. Um, I think that's my last slide. Um, oh, no, so th this is a little bit of a, uh, uh, a teaser that goes into um, 
uh, tomorrow's breakout session and so for Biomac. Uh, and one of the things that we've done over the last uh, year is put out a number of requests for information and held an industry day to really find out how can we do uh, the the biomap better and how how do we how do we shape that to meet the needs of both what the U.S. government wants from a pandemic response capability, but also what are the barriers from our uh, industry partners from joining and, and partnering with the U.S. government? And so between the RFI, uh, which had uh, almost 90 uh, respondents, and the industry day it was a virtual industry day that we held back in January, we had what I think is good participation. Uh, and, and good feedback uh, from those, uh, those two events. Um, and again, we'll, we'll talk more about that in our breakout session, um, but the, the barriers are, are probably not uh, surprising uh, to, uh, to anyone that is tracking this space. It's really looking at the, the commitment by the U.S. government, uh, both from a funding uh, and, and an operational uh, standpoint. Um, what, how will these facilities be sustained? And then uh, the, the need of the U.S. government to have priority access to the manufacturing capabilities during a, a, a public health emergency. And what, what does that really mean in, in, in practice if we need to exercise uh, those, that, that priority right um, that we have established with our industry partners? Again, we'll get into a lot more detail tomorrow in a breakout session, and um, it, it, for those that are planning to attend that, I'm, I'm really looking forward um, to uh, your engagement and your feedback on a number of these issues because we're, we're really marching down the road of, of forming um, the consortium model that I'll also talk about tomorrow in more detail. And so, you know, we, we, we have a few more months to shape what that looks like and how, our, uh, how we're moving forward. So we're definitely interested in your feedback uh, today and tomorrow um, on, on what your thoughts are and how we can make that better. And I believe, yes, and here's my, uh, it, uh, my contact info. If you have any questions, would like to uh, email uh, me and the team, uh, biomap at hhs.gov is, is the right uh, uh, email address. And with that, I will turn it over to Arlene. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. All right. Uh, good afternoon again. Uh, I'm Arlene Joyner. I'm uh, the second branch chief um, within PCI. I'm happy to be here to share a little bit more about our CDMO network branch and some of the things that we are working on, um, that we've been working on, and as we go forward, what we're, we're planning for the future. So, um, okay. So we focus primarily on fill finish manufacturing with some small molecule manufacturing in there. Yes, please. Do your do your thing. <laughs> to fix a microphone. Okay. Is that better? Okay. It's kind of loud here. Okay. Um, and, and the reason we focus primarily on fill finish is actually because the fill finish manufacturing network that uh, uh, that was mentioned earlier, um, actually in Mike's and Tim's presentation earlier, as well as Gary mentioned it this morning, um, was stood up in uh, 2013. And that came out of a FEMC report from the H1N1 pandemic uh, that there was a lack of fill finish uh, capacity uh, to support a pandemic. So the fill finish manufacturing network was born. And then in 2018, uh, we took a look and said, well, there are a lot of other services that many of the BARDA contract uh, prime contracts are utilizing um, for different stages of their life cycle development. So uh, we took that on as um, kind of a charge to understand what the landscape is, what are the different CMOs out there, um, what are their capabilities, and how could they help support some of our other prime contractors within BARDA. Um, again, we want to have a win-win. When they are subcontracting, we want to make sure it's a good match and they've got the skills that they need to help them become successful. So um, that's how we started the CDMO network. 
the, the second one there is industrial base expansion, and that again, Joe's going to talk a little bit more about that, but that came outside of or out of the COVID response where we were given um, money from Congress for industrial base expansion on areas that we, um, from lessons learned, recognized were gaps uh, from our response capability. So in my group, we focused again on fill finish and that capacity. And then we have a small molecule group. So the small molecule group um, really focuses on API, domestic manufacturing. Uh, so we have a contract for that that we lead here in PCI, but also our small molecule SMEs support a lot of the other projects um, in terms of research and development or advanced manufacturing on uh, the flu and the uh, CBRN sides as well. Okay. So for the CDMO network itself, um, really, again, it was to know what's, what's the landscape out there. What are all the different companies, uh, the CMOs, that can do fill finish? Which, which ones of them can do uh, development work? Which ones have um, analytical testing? Uh, so it's really an end-to-end -end review of what is out there. And fortunately, on our team, we have a lot of industry experience. Um, so a lot of us have worked with some of these companies previously. Um, but if we haven't, we get a lot of names and contacts through the TechWatch system, or some just contact us. Uh, what we try to do as part of the CDMO network is we actually, um, we have a database we're maintaining their capabilities, we send them a questionnaire, and we also go out to their sites and we actually visit them. Um, so we want to confirm uh, the capabilities that they have, take a look at what their strengths are and also what their weaknesses are. So we know what they can do and what they cannot do. And a lot of that, again, is in preparation for the next public health emergency. So when we need to call on someone, or if even not during a pandemic, um, one of our contractors needs a service, oftentimes the project officers will come to us and say, hey, who do you know can do this or has this capability? And we can look in our database and we can review the companies that we've been to and suggest some of them that we know um, could probably meet their needs and then at least provide contact information so that they can um, meet directly uh, between them and uh, decide if it's a good match. Um, we also, part of that is also developing the relationships. So, and I think that's something that BARDA really excels at, um, and, and we take that to heart as well. Developing those relationships, getting to know uh, these companies and their uh, points of contact up front, even outside of even having a contract with them. So many of them, they understand we are not necessarily engaging on a financial contract. We just want to know what they can offer and also share with them um, some of the strategies or the programs similar to what we're doing at BARDA Industry Day today. Um, let them know what we think is going to be happening in future in terms of programs. Um, a lot of the companies uh, are new to government contracting and have not worked with the government. So we do a lot of um, back and forth discussion and educating on how things work, types of contracting, um, and then at the, uh, you know, again on the other side, get to know what their companies can offer and also what maybe their strategic plans are going forward, how they're gonna grow, what capabilities do they think that they're gonna be adding um, based on their business models. So again, strategies are listed there. We want to expand as many capabilities as possible in terms of, again, knowing what that landscape is so that we know when someone uh, asks us for assistance that we can support them. Um, improve logistics, maintaining preparedness, again, that's, that's really our un underlying theme is we want to know who's out there now instead of when a pandemic hits we don't want to go to Google and try to find somebody who can meet you know, a service that we need. So we want to have that information and be more proactive about knowing um, who's available. Okay. Um, and, and really, COVID was a, a nice case study for us. We actually had three companies, I'm sorry, 13 companies that were in our network that we had already previously had relationships with and we were able to call upon them and utilize them and have them participate in the COVID response. Um, and that was huge. Uh, Fill Finish was a real big part of that. Uh, all the companies that were used to fill the vaccines, any CMOs that were used, we had already had relationships with them. We may have already even had contracts with them, but we didn't have contracts with all of them. But we had contact information, we had been to their sites, and we were able to visit, um, visit them again and discuss, again, what were their uh, capacities. Early on in the uh, response in, I guess it's April, 
March and April, we actually contacted most of the fill finish CMOs and asked them what was their capacity for the rest of the year and going into 2021. And that was in anticipation of the six vaccines we knew and some of the therapeutics were gonna need to get filled just about at the same time at the end of 2020. Um, so we set about uh, finding out what capacities were available and working with them um, to either reserve that capacity or match them up with some of the vaccine manufacturers so they would have a direct contract. Um, and then all, some of them we actually helped to accelerate new filling lines that were being installed um, so that they would be ready and be uh, available for use when these uh, products were available to be filled. So again, a, a nice success story, um, and it's one we want to continue to do is develop those relationships. Okay. Uh, so benefits, again, knowing contract mechanisms and the different types of contracts. We found that that is something critical for most CMOs who have never worked with the government. Um, which is majority of them. So, uh, and, and everyone here in this room knows the government contracting is not easy. Uh, it's not always the same. There's different contracting mechanisms we have to use depending on the allocations, the color of money, which ones can do construction, which ones can be used for purchasing. So we go through a lot of that with these uh, CMOs ahead of time. Um, they're able to uh, carry on dialogue with us so that we can help them understand that. Obviously, they oftentimes need to get their legal groups involved. So, you know, a lot of that, again, knowing it up front and being prepared for when there's an emergency is beneficial, especially for those companies. Um, the collaboration and, and engagement, again, I can't emphasize that more. The relationships that we have with these companies was critical for COVID response and having them really, a lot of these companies stepped up. When we needed uh, capacity for filling, they offered up their facilities um, and a lot of them came to us and said, what can we do to help? We know you're gonna need a lot of filling. So again, those relationships were critical. Um, let's see, also the other thing is, Having a dialogue and a discussion, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, is have, having them understand what our plans are going in the future. Um, we've had many companies, CMOs, come to us and say, we're considering growing and building a certain capability. So for instance, if it was fill finish, they would ask, um, do you see a future in uh, pre-filled syringes or do you see more in auto injectors or uh, sterile bags or those types of things? So we can give them feedback on what we see from a government perspective and it could be reflective or might not be of what the commercial market's gonna be, but at least they have an idea what we anticipate seeing in the future. Um, some of our needs as uh, a government agency um, to support a pandemic is gonna be large-scale manufacturing. So if they're looking at large-scale manufacturing, they might talk to us, but if they're only looking for things that are smaller scale, um, we might tell them that's a good capability for you to have, but we not, might not be able to utilize that in terms of a pandemic, right? Because we might need mass quantities, but it may be used for other barter contracts that are, again, smaller scale. So again, just giving them that feedback, I think is beneficial and that collaboration, um, hugely helpful in a pandemic when things don't always go as expected in a contract, having that relationship where you're collaborating and working with them, um, I think benefits both sides, right? Because some things often, in, uh, in a pandemic response, when things are time critical, they don't always go as, as expected, so sometimes um, you have to work with them in terms of deliverables and things in the contract. So our small molecule group, um, we have a great group of subject matter experts, and I will say there's not a lot of them out in the industry. So we had, a, it took us a long time to actually find SMEs that had industry experience in small molecule manufacturing. And it's an area that um, PCI or MFE previously had not had a lot of focus on. Um, but we do, we leverage the diverse backgrounds. You can see chemists, pharmacists, engineers, materials management, IP, contracts and, and business models as well. So um, our SMEs are cross-matrix, and it's not even just small molecule, all throughout PCI. All of our SMEs are, are matrix so that they participate on uh, project teams throughout BARDA. So some are in FLU, some are on CBRN, and some of them support our own projects that we, we lead, which are predominantly infrastructure related. Um, so they provide industry experience, um, they're consultants, they review documents, um, 
a lot of regulatory experience as well. Many of our SMEs have um, five, 10, 30 years of industry experience, and it's really invaluable. Um, and it's a nice benefit that contractors, companies that we contract with get that. They really get uh, a high level of quality consulting from our SMEs. Okay. Okay. So these are uh, some of the kind of technologies that we support. Um, so continuous flow, continuous manufacturing is a big one, and we're trying to emphasize that more as an advanced technology. Um, Infrastructure-based, generic manufacturing, um, antivirals, uh, oral and intravenous therapeutics, and we also support the SNS as they do purchases as well. Um, so all of our SMEs participate on those different project teams, and the companies listed there is not, not completely all-inclusive, but these are many of the companies that um, our SMEs participate on those project teams, again, throughout BARDA, not only in PCI. They're helping out in the antivirals, in flu, um, and also on the CBRN side. So many different companies um, that we help and participate with on their projects. And then the last group in my area is, again, the industrial base expansion. So focusing on fill finish, again, that came out of COVID response and recognizing that we needed additional surge capacity. Um, our goal is that in the next pandemic, we can fill 100 million doses per month for either a BSL-1 vaccine or a BSL-2 vaccine. So BSL-2 is um, more live virus vaccines. BSL-1 are those that are, I'm going to say, your traditional vaccines. Um, capabilities, we want these companies, they have to be able to design, build, and commission filling lines. Um, and it's not just the filling line itself. We really are looking at end-to-end. -end. So uh, filling, packaging, inspection, all finishing. Uh, the one that's not listed there is actually storage. We found, as many of you know, during COVID response that uh, drug substance needed minus 80 degree uh, storage. Um, fill f I'm sorry, the drug product, the finished product, often needed minus 20 or minus 80 for some. And that was an area that was very much lacking um, from a national perspective. So we work with them on actually getting capacities, uh, storage capacity. So all of our contracts or industrial base expansion do include, again, those end-to-end -end capabilities. So storage is included in there. And these are the six companies um, that we have industrial base expansion contracts with now. Uh, those are most likely to go out uh, three years, so 2024. Most of them were awarded either in late 21 or earlier this year. They'll go to 2024, 2025, um, and then we have um, a priority access with them. So we have access to those companies in the future in case there's a public health emergency that they would prioritize government um, work uh, at their fill finish facilities. And then at the bottom there, this is, is another nice little success story for monkeypox that came about over the summer. Um, Grand River um, Aseptic Manufacturing, Graham, was able to step up, and they, we partnered with them for filling the Bavarian Nordic vaccine. So um, three different contracts there, uh, and they were able to rapidly qualify domestic fill finish. And that's actually in progress now, but again, a nice relationship with Graham. They stepped up um, and were able to support us um, in a, a time of need when uh, timeliness was very important. So what's next? Um, again, we want to expand the landscape. We don't want to focus just on fill finish. We want to look at that end to end in terms of what other services are out there um, that we should be looking at. Um, and we do that through trade conferences. Tech Watch is again another one and we do a lot of site visits. Um, so we might be coming to your facility sometime soon in the future. Um, we are collaborating with the IBMSC program, um, which is at the ASPR level, to expand the small molecule domestic manufacturing program. Again, uh, that's an area we've found with essential medicines being in shortage over COVID response. That was a gap. So we're working with that ASPR department to help build that up, pending additional funding, of course. Um, and then the BSL-2 capacity I mentioned uh, for fill finish, uh, we are short of the 100 million doses per month goal. So we have um, a few hundred, a few million uh, go doses left to fill. So we will be putting a solicitation out um, to actually fill that and pull in one other fill finish company to meet those requirements. 
And that's it for me. Please join us tomorrow. We do have that breakout session specifically with the CDMO network, um, and we will have representation from CBRN and FLU joining us for that breakout session. So with that, I will turn it over to Joe. That. I'll leave that alone. Everybody can hear me okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to try and wrap up so we do have a few minutes at the end for a little Q&A. So uh, try to keep it to roughly 10 minutes or so, maybe 12. Um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, so yeah, Joe Figlio, I'm the branch chief, the last of the branch chiefs for today. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, some of our capacity expansion initiatives over the past few years. Um, as well as kind of some things that we did prior to COVID arriving, right, and some of the responsibilities of the branch, um, you know, before the pandemic hit. Uh, as Tim mentioned, he talked about the, uh, the Biomac initiative uh, that kind of maybe evolved from our CDIM program back in 2012 that started back then. Uh, our Lean CDMO network has been around since before the pandemic, uh, a few years prior to that, I believe. And, um, you know, so again, other things that we've been doing since, you know, our organization has been in existence has been related to, you know, some supply chain issues, but also really, you know, industrial based capacity in the U.S. for flu, right, primarily, as well as other things that may come into play, what keeps the flu manufacturers running. Um, so during the pandemic, uh, if we start with this first circle here, some of the early, I guess, the early initiatives involved the Defense Production Act, right? If you're not familiar with that, that's, it was used for procurement of either vaccines, materials, or industrial base uh, expansion projects. Um, and that was a way to get priority access, right, for the companies who are manufacturing, building capacity, et cetera. Uh, we relied on that, but that also impacted the availability of other life-saving life-enhancing medicines, right? So you may be familiar with that as well. Uh, over the past few years, there's been many other non-COVID uh, products, companies that have been, you know, suffering to get what they need to, you know, to maintain their capacity and keep uh, other things, you know, flowing at hospitals, et cetera. Um, then we tried to evolve into the middle section here to, um, to reduce these domestic, I'm sorry, DPA authority, reduce the rated orders. And how do we do that, right? We needed to build up capacity. Uh, some things that we did starting in mid-2020 have already, uh, you know, been completed and are, and are having, you know, effects on the, uh, the industry right now. Some things are still a few years away from being completed. So in order to reduce this, the rated orders and the need to, you know, short another uh, industry, related industry, we needed to build up capacity of certain things. Um, and then the last box or last circle on the right, how do we keep this going in the future? And a few of us are working on different plans for that. Like how do, you know, we've spoken with companies weekly and, you know, daily over the past few years, but that's fading out now. Uh, how do we keep those relationships, some of which we never had prior to the pandemic, how do we keep those going in the future and what will that look like? Um, so the environment that we were working in uh, on the far right here, you know, we were dealing with not only the, the demand in the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, right? Um, deep freeze in Texas from a few years ago. Uh, cobalt 60, a shortage of cobalt 60, which is used for sterilization. Uh, silicone used in chips as well as tubing, right? Just all these things that, uh, these levels that we were digging into in order to, uh, you know, figure out what needed to be improved, what capacity needed to be improved, and how we can best, you know, operate in the future. Um, this is just an overview slide. I'll touch on each of these categories in a minute. <clears throat> um, but basically, as Arlene stated, I believe 600 million doses in six to nine months is our target. Um, you know, needles and syringes and vials on the left, that we knew about pre-pandemic. Pre we knew there was going to be a shortage of those, right? If any pharma company who orders vials, you know, they knew previously there was, you know, many months of lead time, and then likely they were coming from another country, not necessarily from the U.S. Uh, sterilization, 
um, that was kind of a newer category. Uh, Single-use technologies, which encompasses a lot of different areas from tubing, bags, filters. Um, obviously, the industry, the farm industry has been moving to that single-use uh, manufacturing environment for 20 plus years now. Um, raw materials we'll touch on and some fill finish that Arlene has already mentioned. You might not need to touch on that at all. So let's jump right in. Um, so yeah, vials, as I said, you know, not only the vials, but the tubing, the glass tubing that's used to make the vials, right? There's a, uh, has been a shortage of that. You know, it could take many, many months to get an order of, you know, vials in. And then we had to consider, you know, the biggest thing here is what brand of vials, what type of vials. There's new vials out there, um, new materials that are being used. Uh, we used, I believe, five, four or five different manufacturers during the pandemic. We have projects with four currently. Uh, there's the ready-to-use vials, right, pre-sterilized, and those are gaining in popularity. There's the glass tubing. There's new uh, aluminosilicate vials, which are much more durable. Uh, those really took off during the pandemic, as well as a hybrid vial, which is not glass at all, but a plastic hybrid vial, which was used. We built up capacity in the first six months, and those were used to roll out some of the first Moderna vac uh, vaccines. Sterilization portfolio, these are not in necessarily any um, order that makes sense, but for sterilization, you know, there were issues with, you know, some sites being where they're located. For instance, Puerto Rico, there's storms in Puerto Rico. There's a lot of, a couple uh, sterilization facilities down there. They may be shut down at the time, but the biggest thing we had to deal with here was the supply of cobalt, right? Cobalt 60 is used to do the gamma sterilization. We're trying to invest in x-ray technology. Um, there's also ETO, which has its own concerns with you know, the environment. Uh, but there's certain categories of products that need to go through a certain type of sterilization. So we're looking to expand the x-ray technology and uh, increase the, you know, decrease the lead time, right? There was sometimes the materials were ready to get to the manufacturer, but they still had to be sterilized, and that was an unknown. It could be a, a few days, it could be a few weeks before the companies would get back those materials that were already made before they could actually use them. Um, Cobalt 60 has been a constraint for a while. It's primarily one of the main sources comes from Russia, and, you know, there's, there's questions on the supply and how far, you know, that will last. Every year is different as far as where the cobalt is coming from, and it takes a year, well, a year, each year the facilities need to be recharged with new cobalt sources. So that will be improved if we can expand the x-ray technology. Okay. Uh, Single-use technologies. This encompassed a lot of different areas, uh, from 2D and 3D bags to filters, tubing, and bottles. Right, all these components, as well as others. That, you know, we didn't even get to things like connectors, uh, tie wraps, all kinds of things that were a constant constraint um, over the past few years. So, this was a tough one to get a handle on because you not only have these materials that are used for the manufacturing, but you have different companies that are specifying specific, you know, filters or tubing or bags. You know, they can't just use anyone. They already have, you know, in their in their uh, documentation, right? A certain filter is used for manufacturing. You can't just use whatever one is available. You need to use the same one. So here we have um, a, a number of different projects. As you can see in the gray, we still have a lot of unmet requirements here. So we're still, this is part of, you know, probably the biggest part of what we need to do over the next few years and work is work on this category of, of items. Um, needles and syringes. I could talk about this one all day. Uh, <laughs> we knew prior to the pandemic that we did not have enough capability to make enough in the US. And uh, what we did here, and this is probably our first success as well, uh, we partnered with three companies to build up US capacity. Um, I'd say two and three quarters of those projects are completed now. We are easily making, have the ability to make 800 million more per year in the US. Um, but you know, two of those three companies had as their uh, 
commercial model, they were supplying the U.S. from their manufacturing plants in other countries as their business model. Uh, so now we have a lot more capacity in the U.S. These started off, again, with some of the Vials projects in mid-2020, so we're quite a ways away. We're quite a ways down the road for these. Uh, let's see. Bioprocessing portfolio, kind of a newer category. Uh, this started off a while back, too. Uh, I think it was under Tim um, last year. Uh, chromatography resins and cell culture media, right? We feel like with the projects we have going on here, we're in a, we're in a good place to increase by 12 metric tons of cell culture media and 5,000 liters of chromatography resins. Those projects are underway and still have probably a good couple years to go before they're fully in place. Raw materials, this one is unique in that it is related to primarily mRNA manufacturing, right? Prior to the pandemic, we weren't making, you know, massive amounts of mRNA vaccines, right, in the U.S. or anywhere else. So a lot of these particular items, you know, were not being made in large quantities or not enough, right? So this, you know, there's six different items listed here. I won't go through them all, but we have projects going on very well in five of them and still working on uh, some unmet requirement of NTPs down in the, in the bottom right. And I think Phil finished portfolio here. As Arlene mentioned, the six projects, right, Arlene? Yeah, six projects that are underway. Um, puts us in a good position with BSL-1, still a little bit more to do with BSL-2, but, um, you know, again, targeting. Again, that's something we knew also was not good. We didn't have the capacity for it at the beginning of the pandemic. Phil finished capacity was going to be a constraint, so that's something that was started early on. A uh, quick note on, as I mentioned earlier, influenza capacity, right? Been doing that. I've been involved with Sanofi and Securus since probably 2009. Um, you know, we have certain contracts and agreements with them in place, whether it's a supply of eggs or, you know, increasing uh, capacity uh, with Sanofi for a flu, a recombinant flu product. Uh, Securus, we were involved with them in their facility down in Holly Springs, right, and still are engaged with them on a regular basis. Uh, they added another filling line of their own down there, a high-speed filling line. Um, but, you know, we have adjuvant manufacturing as well as, uh, you know, contracts in place to switch over for pandemic response with both of these companies. So we're continuing our relationships with them. And then lastly, I just wanted to <clears throat> say a thank you to, obviously I don't think any of these companies are in the room here. This is just our staff. Um, Hopefully a lot of these companies are online virtually and listening. Uh, we all heard, you know, about Pfizer and Moderna for the past few years, right, every night on the news. But uh, these companies are, I'm not going to list them out, but hopefully you can see the slide if you're watching virtually. These companies keep, you know, pharma running on a regular daily basis, right? And then they, they ramped it up considerably during the pandemic. So I wanted to thank them all. We've continued working with them and hopefully we'll continue in the future what that looks like exactly, we don't know, but these companies are what keeps pharma going all the time, but you just don't hear about them on the news, so thank you to all those companies. And with that, uh, that's it. I'm gonna stop there. We have, again, the breakout sessions tomorrow. So, thank you. one question, and that is uh, regarding the CDMOs, what portion of your engagements are with international versus domestic organizations? You want to read that again? Yeah. Is that better? Okay, great. Uh, regarding CDMOs, what portion of your engagements are with international versus domestic organizations? So I will say almost all of them are domestic organizations. So we do prioritize that. Uh, for the Phil Finish Manufacturing Network, it was uh, a requirement that it was domestic manufacturing. Um, so we do look at CMOs, and for travel reasons, we are looking mostly domestic. We don't count out international, and many of the CMOs that we look at domestically have international um, facilities and services as well. Um, but we do prioritize the domestic companies if they have those capabilities internationally, um, and it's something that we can't get locally or domestically, then we're, we'll use the international services, but um, priority is given for domestic.
that's the question we have in the chat. If uh, there's any additional questions, please join us tomorrow at the breakout sessions or during our virtual booth. Thank you. Thank you.